Just to begin with, uh, I'm very privileged to be here to be the moderator of this panel discussion because I have been working with these young people, these highly motivated youth for the past about two or three days. Being with them, understanding them, knowing what they have to say and all that they have done. And let me tell you, the floor, all these young people up there who are here, this is the session that you can take a lot back from. Because these are young people your age who have transformed the world, the local world they were living in. So let me introduce Ahmed, who is right up here. Ahmed is a youth policy advisor, the League of Arab States. He's 27 year old Jordanian who works as a youth policy advisor in the League of Arab States. It's a privilege to have him this evening here. Previously, he worked as a youth program associate at the United Nations Population Fund. Iraq office and in safety children as emergency program officer. Mr. Alhamdawi is a co-founder of Jordanian Commission for Democratic Culture and the first elected president of Youth for Democratic Movement. Mr. Ahmed is specialized in youth policies, non-formal education. He worked with many regional and international organizations in training programs and research and issues around youth policy, youth participation, and human rights education. So without wasting much time, let me ask Ahmed to begin on, give an overall view on what actually Arab Spring and Arab Youth is all about. Thank you, Sebastian and Dajit, for the very nice introduction. And uh, up on the unit of my colleagues here, we would like to start by asking you just to stand a moment of silence for all the souls of the people who died in the revolutions and the people who died asking for their dignity, their dignity and their freedom. So, you may kindly just uh, stand up for a moment of silence for all the sorts of people who died. I, I, I feel very much privileged to, to be able to address this uh, Youth Assembly in this uh, ninth edition this year, the uh, Youth Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, I have been saying that uh, previously that I'm a frequent player for the Youth Assembly and I believe in this platform that enables the youth leaders from all, uh, all around the world to interact and share their thoughts and experiences. This is my third time and uh, my third appearance at the Youth Assembly and I think this is an extremely important uh, platform that we can share and we can learn from each other. And today I feel uh, very much privileged to share this panel with this special youth leader from the region who are representing uh, a real success story. I was to talking with them and I said uh, we might hear about a presentation saying about successful projects and successful examples. And for one who is working and mainly a practitioner in the youth field, I don't know about any project in the youth history was more successful than the Arab youth revolutions. They changed the teams and they are making and achieving history. What the young people did in Tunisia and Egypt and their fellows in uh, the rest of the Arab countries are making a huge example, like a, a, a lifetime example for everyone asking about the proof, about the cost of excluding young people from decision making. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to hear all the answers from my, my colleagues here. And I think you are all inspired. You don't need more inspiration. But we are sharing a very special story of the Arab region and why the Arab youth are taking the need to the, the, the shaping the history of the very Arab history. And I know like I was asking some of you about what are your expectations from this session. And some of you were asking about, uh, would like to know the story of the Arab youth and the story of the Arab Spring and others. They would like to know how the social media will mobilize and use during the revolutions and what are the next steps for the revolution and uh, what are the young people going to do. And I think these questions will be answered by all the panelists. But I will just send and share some uh, quick messages with you that I think they are important to be shared at the, let me say, at the regional scene. I work at the Intergovernmental Regional Organization for the RFP and I can tell you like uh, for all the people who are questioning about if there is something called Arab countries and Arab world, I can happily confirm to you that there is something called Arab world and Arab countries that were the 
young person went and suffered Tunisia, other countries and all around the Arab countries, they were in the streets, like showing solidarity and then asking for their rights to democracy and to, to freedom. I believe that uh, all the numbers, all the facts in the Arab countries showing very important uh, lessons that could be shared with other governments and other, other regimes. The Arab youth are suffering from high level of unemployment, as well as many youth around the world. They are suffering from poor educational system. And not only when we talk about unemployment, I don't mean finding jobs. We are talking about the quality of these jobs. I, it's easy to find jobs, but sometimes the quality of these uh, jobs in the market, they are, we have big question marks about them. We are talking about a poor educational system. We are talking about very important thing that the young people, they don't feel themselves represented in their countries. They are not part of the decision making. And most importantly, the feel of marginalization. And when the young people feel hopeless, then this would be a normal result to leading the young people to, to move in the streets. We have many questions about whether the social media was the reason why the young people uh, went to the street and made the revolution. And we have this big argument that we believe the social media was a very important tool that supported the Arab youth to, to do what they are doing. But we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, there are many revolutions in the history that happened without social media. And the fact that what's happening in the Arab region was because many reasons related to education, related to decision making processes, related to corruption, related to not having democratic regimes, and other factors that mainly uh, was the reason why the young people went to the sea. I'm going to conclude with this and maybe we can, we can have like, more rounds to talk about why the, uh, the Arab Spring and the youth, uh, what kind of lessons could be learned from the Arab Spring and the youth movements. And uh, I'm sure that we have some, some messages to be shared with the governments and other recommendations for the international community and many others as well for the youth, the groups and movements. And I would like just to, to ask you to, to think again about the Arab, all the stereotypes that we might have about the Arabs. I know that we many, like maybe a bit ignorant about the Arab countries and other things that uh, the Arabs like, the, like eggs in one basket, they are all the same. And I think we should revisit again our understanding for the Arab countries and know that the Arab youth, they are people with aspirations for the future, and they are people who have the talents to do and to innovate, and they are not only protecting other people's interests in the region, they have their own aspirations, and I believe the Arab youth will, will reshape the Arab history, and they are reshaping the Arab history. I'm looking forward to hearing my colleagues and their inputs about all the different aspects they are looking to, to the Arab Spring. From Tunisia is a biologist who is also a blogger. She actively participated in the Tunisian revolution by relaying the events on social networks. She blogs now for the French newspaper Liberation and Democratic Transition in Tunisia. Welcome board. So before January 14th, many people have never heard about Tunisia. Tunisia is a small country with North and Africa, Central Africa, and Central Asia. Has always been seen by foreigners as a peaceful country and a paradise for tourists. Yet in this country, many, many people were suffering. Political opponents were tortured, all demonstrations were forbidden, and any hope for freedom was repressed, condemning some people to exile. Tunisia has been a dictatorship for almost 50 years, including 23 years under the authority of. President the former president and his family controlled the whole of the Tunisian economy. The innovation of Mohammed Bouazizi was a catalyst in the expression of the frustration of the Tunisian people. The wall of fear that characterized the lives of Tunisians finally fell down. Helped by social networks, the Tunisian made the world discover the reality of what was always considered as a handle. Thank you. 
demonstrations and taking to the streets. Young Tunisians inspired Egyptian youth, then others around the world, because today it makes no difference to be a young Tunisian or a young Chinese or whatever. Young from all around the world aspire the same things, work and individual liberty. There are no people more ready for democracy than another. There is no place in the world where people deserve more than another to choose to go around with them. Freedom is a universal human right. These events are resonating so widely because the core problems of Tunisia are coming to just about every country in the region. A growing population of young people at once who are educated and ambitious unemployed and frustrated and resentful mother. Therefore, it is more than ever time to bring together efforts in order to think of solutions to the problems of the youth in the world. More than ever, youth are the real engine of change in the world. It is time for governments to allow young people to actually access the state responsibilities by introducing a quota or affirmative action in government posts. In Tunisia, young people in Tunisia young people want to be the real actors in the implementation of democracy in the country. They want to participate in the political life because they have been deprived of this for 23 years old. Many young people have built in political parties since the battle of the former president, more than 100 political parties were created. Young Tunisians are today deeply involved in setting up the elections for a constituent assembly that will have the role of rewriting the Tunisian constitution. Many young people volunteer to be observer of these elections or to assist in the registration of voters on the list. And there is a real awareness campaign on social networks like Facebook or Twitter to call people to go register. Other people are participating through the formation of associations which were totally under the control of the government over the past years. For me, I decided to get involved in my own way by doing what I do best, writing. Brothers have played a major role before the revolution by denouncing the excesses of the regime and during the revolution by relaying information on events and massacres that occurred in the country. Today I run a blog for the French newspaper Liberation, in which I describe the situation in Tunisia. Writing for a newspaper is a real opportunity for me to get more readers and to aware people of the necessity to get involved. Today for Tunisian youth, involvement is a moral obligation because if they don't, this revolution will definitely be hijacked by the old regime. And I think that the involvement and vigilance of civil society is the only guarantee to prevent a dictatorship to settle in the country. The success of the democratic transition will require a lot of patience and vigilance. Finally, I cannot finish without a deep thought for the Syrian and the Libyan people who continue to suffer daily massacres. Authoritarian regimes should learn from the new Arab revolution and focus on the democratization of political systems around the world, which are the only guarantee of lasting world peace. Thank you. We have Karima, who is a Moroccan journalist, development and social media and communication specialist, currently working with an international development agency. She has more than 10 years of experience working with youth and civil society. She is the Vice President of the Mediterranean Forum of Youth and Childhood in Morocco. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you just had uh, an overview of the Arab Spring from a Tunisian perspective, from my reading on now. And as she said, the Tunisian revolution has inspired uh, many other countries, uh, and it was expanded to uh, Egypt, uh, Yemen, Morocco, Libya, Syria, and other countries. But before I give you um, a very short analysis of why are you use social media uh, to mobilize uh, youth and raise awareness about the different movement causes, uh, I would like to stress that, uh, first of all, 
Click on the slide. Okay. Um, I would like to, to stress that the revolution did not start with uh, and what Sisi said in fire on themselves. And as my colleague Ahmed said, in, in the previous years, there were many uh, uh, forms of protest in, in the Arab world. And since 2005, we've been seeing uh, after the assassination of the Lebanese people, uh, the one million march of Lebanese people protesting and marching for freedom and dignity. And we started seeing a lot of one million marches across the Arab world um, beside the usual uh, marches of support and solidarity with the Palestinian cause. We started seeing a lot of marches at the regional level, uh, marching for dignity, for freedom, for democracy. And uh, the second thing is that uh, in 2007 and 2008 and 2009, we, we started talking a lot about the blogosphere community in the Arab world. And um, the, the, we have witnessed the emergence of the blogosphere community, uh, mostly in Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, who reported on the deterioration uh, conditions, uh, social, economic, uh, political problems affecting their communities. And uh, many of those publications uh, were actually censored, and many of those bloggers were arrested and taken to jail, um, and many didn't even have the right of fair trial, and uh, some were judged with the penal code as criminals, uh, and not even with the press code. Uh, and until now, the majority of journalists are struggling uh, to change the press code and include uh, new regulations which uh, protect, uh, protect, uh, sorry, protect bloggers and uh, journalists from uh, these arrests. Yet these censorships, which was like the, like the catalyst of several revolutions, did not stop Arab youth from finding new ways of communicating their causes. And the more uh, we, we started seeing censorship, the more it made uh, young people more determined, uh, pushing millions of undecided people uh, to be active and mobilizing people to find more creative ways uh, to organize and communicate. Uh, I just want to give you a, a little example. Uh, in Egypt, when communication was disrupted uh, in Egypt for about five days, uh, most of the young people resorted basically to their cell phones, blackberries, and iPhones to document what's going on and sharing uh, information with, with each other. And many, uh, from my own experience, we, we stayed like 24 hours and 24 hours in front of our computers dying for information and consulting Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to see what's going on in Egypt. Uh, another uh, point is that uh, public channels were living in, in a dream. They, they were like uh, uh, living in a different world I'll give just example, for example, of the uh, Libyan channel and uh, Egypt channel during these revolutions. Uh, they, they were uh, broadcasting uh, music and movies where as hundreds of people were dying every day. So they were like insulting the intelligence of Arab youth. And uh, also satellite channels like, for example, the famous uh, Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and the Arab world, they had no choice but to, uh, to um, to start using this kind of social media uh, because they were just surpassed by the rapid uh, and real time and interactive media. And uh, we, we started seeing Al Jazeera doing live streaming, um, tweet, tweeting, and, and uh, updating information on, on Facebook, etc. And uh, we started seeing also the creation of many uh, Facebook uh, channels and uh, Facebook newspapers. Uh, who started uh, uh, calling people in the field uh, with, as witnesses to share information uh, about what's going on. And then, uh, why social media was important? Because of five major factors. I'm going around uh, uh, very quickly. Um, as I said, public media was state controlled. So it was owned by the state, controlled by the state. And uh, uh, young people did not have a space in, social, in, the, in, the, in public media. Uh, whereas social media is not 100% controlled, whereas now uh, we started seeing a lot of cyber space police uh, 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 going on Facebook with Facebook profiles and, and following uh, the activities of some uh, active young leaders. Uh, public media also was very absent from grassroots issues. 
So people did not have the space to talk about their issues in television and radio, etc. So that's why we resorted to uh, public media, to uh, social media. And, and uh, before the last one, uh, we had a lot of issues of freedom of expression, uh, a lot of red lines, what to talk about, what we cannot talk about, and issues of accessing information. Uh, you, journalists now have a hard time to access to information, let alone the, the, the public. And um, when our social media is open for everybody, you know, you don't have to be a professional journalist, you don't have to, to speak uh, in, uh, very well, you know, you know, you can speak in your own language and then you can comment, interact, it's crossing borders, you know, you're behind your computers and the whole world is uh, seeing what, what, you're, what you're writing. And uh, finally, I'd like um, uh, to conclude uh, with one point, is that uh, if this civil society uh, was strong, if political parties were doing their job in, in, in guiding you, in mobilizing you, if the public media was close in addressing new issues, I don't think uh, we will we'll have that massive mobilization of social media. Anyway. We have Majid, who is right up there, the extreme right, 23 year old from Palestine. Worked as media communication officer at UNESCO, Ramadan office, specialized in social media and campaigning training for the MDG. They call it the digital revolution or the revolution of technology. I call it the revolution of young people who finally managed to use the best tool to mobilize the revolution. We already know that the importance of social media in marketing and in brand awareness and communication. But finally, now we are bringing a new example and new use of social media in democracy and fighting and fighting repression. As Karima pointed, uh, that social media is beyond the state uh, censorship and the state control, and uh, this makes, makes more sense to the existence of so many um, interaction of other youth uh, and the different social media, especially uh, we're talking about like, the socially connected people uh, that uh, were connected in different places in uh, the social media and this is interactive uh, community of social media. But yet again, social media was a tool that young people used to mobilize the public to speak about uh, uh, the different uh, struggles and challenges in their life and then also to update the world community about what's going on in the ground when people are protesting in a country square or elsewhere in other countries. Uh, but at the same time, we have to admit if people are ready to come out, media and social media can help them to mobilize and move forward. But then we have to admit that people were already ready to go outside the street to speak up and to fight uh, for uh, justice and freedom for uh, the uh, population. Uh, at the same time, uh, the importance of social media came after the lack of uh, legal, um, uh, uh, legal assistance and laws in regard to activism in the other countries. For example, in, in the Western countries, you can go apply or like, get a permit for a uh, protest or an uh, activism. In the other country, it's very hard uh, to understand the procedure. The procedure is really complicated. If you want to organize a protest, you go apply for a permit, then you will never get it. So social media was the only time for young people to go to mobilize and speak up and organize the event and mobilize the other young people to go toward activism. And this is not, was not the only experience for young people to go out the street and speak up, but it was the biggest. There are different actors and different uh, uh, of the civil society and, and young people that managed to mobilize movements against uh, um, uh, discrimination, against like the social poverty and social problems. But now it's the, it's the biggest event that uh, draws the attention of the international community. And at the same time, social social media did not uh, pull us the uh, dictator regime. Social media was the tool that young people and the Arab community use uh, to send uh, their voices and raise awareness about the problems and the causes that are happening in the Arab countries. So they use the social media to communicate, to interact, to speak up, to update the people. And as Karima said, 
said, even when they're in at some point there was a lot of electricity, the young people managed to find the alternative to communicate and uh, to make this activism and and uh, uh, the, uh, the end of the, the thing. So that's why I we cannot know when the Arab revolution will, will end or when it they started. They started a long time ago or they started a couple of years ago. And nowadays it's very interesting that you see that the world public media is taking the social media as a resource. So you see that most of the international media is referring to blogs, referring to bloggers, referring to Facebook groups, and there are so many researches and statistics about how many users of Facebook before and after the revolution, how people managed to, uh, to use the social media before and after. It was for fun and posting photos and interactive. In interaction now it's more about addressing social problems. Social problems. So maybe I have to okay. Maybe I have to speak about like one last point, which is the impact of the social media in the Arab uh, uprising. Uh, it's uh, it's very obvious that there is like you know an obvious uh, overflowing of dictatorship. I mean the general uh, understanding of the dictatorship or a ruling regime that will never disappear. Since I was born, I didn't see a change of any face of an Arab leader. Now it's time for change. It's not. It's time for people to believe that change can happen. At the same time, public media started to consider uh, reviewing their strategies. What should we do to reach people more? What about social media and its involvement uh, in different uh, ways? Other countries and governments managed to already speak, start to speak about information before they, uh, the way of change reached them. And, then, and, and that's why you can see that the move of change is moving from one country to another, and we see a lot of information in the constitution here and there and promises. So, uh, because every country is now expecting uh, this uh, crisis is going to reach them. And then, of course, it's more of the increase of the, of the participation of young people in general. Because it would motivate young people that they were always afraid of this dictatorship and injustice and uh, afraid of, to speak up. Now, I'm motivated to speak more and to interact and to participate more in social media. Thank you very much.
I would also would like to, to start my presentation basically with a story when we met me and Ahmed and a few other Arab delegates here, Farah uh, and others, uh, in Sharm el and the Arab Summit for Social you know, and the Social and, and the Economic Summit of the Arab League in Sharm el in January 2011, just a few days before the Egyptian Revolution and a few days after the Tunisian Revolution. We were in this panel trying to, to share our uh, frustration uh, and also hope for change in the Arab world as young people and one of the uh, senior delegates said that look at the United States, look at the West, uh, dropouts like Bill Gates, established Microsoft, uh, another one like Mark of Facebook, established Facebook and other two young men uh, did Google, uh, what are you doing, what are you presenting to the world and I was actually very frustrated to, to answer him that a dropout in Tunisia of Muhammad Bazizi who also had a similar kind of reality in terms of uh, if you look at it from a, a school kind of perspective but he set himself in fire because he didn't have any prospects so we cannot compare in that sense but the young people of the Arab world changed this reality in very few days in different countries for yeah. okay. <laughs> Uh, so I will start my presentation with this painting which I stole it from, but with reference of course from the MIT Arab Association, uh, Arab Students Association. I usually in my, all my presentation I use it and I find something for everybody in this, which, but this time I will just make a note about it. It shows a uh, painting from the, the Central Asian uh, time, I mean Central Asia region, which represents uh, people with uh, kind of Asian face, Asian culture, but sharing um, knowledge and sharing uh, experience, scientific experience very, very long. So I use it all the time because it reminds me and the audience that we also, uh, as human beings, no matter what kind of dress, what kind of race we're coming from, and I, will, I usually ask the audience, what do you think about this? And they say they are Chinese, they are Central Asian, they are Muslim, they are Arabs. Everybody can find something in this photo. And they are scientists, so it's very representative. Um, What happened in Egypt? What happened in Egypt, a lot of young people uh, have been working very hard, maybe since 2000, at least in, my, in the recent uh, history, I mean, in the very recent and the last decade, have been working very hard to have a voice here, but they haven't been uh, having any mechanisms or channels to voice their uh, needs. I will give focus on one example just for the sake of time, but Khaled Sa'i in Alexandria, the Mediterranean city, he was a young man like any, any one of us. He was in a cyber cafe posting some photos and photo, some videos on YouTube about corruption of the police, where they were sharing bribes between the, the, the police officers when they caught some drugs uh, kind of thing. They are dividing the money between themselves. He posted on YouTube so that the police officers sent two other uh, policemen to, uh, to grab him out from the internet cafe in Alexandria in the middle of the street, beat him up, and even uh, tortured him. In like hitting his head in a marble uh, door entrance in a very horrible incident. The guy was sitting in a police car, uh, drove 100 meters, and then they found out that he did, he's dead, so they drove back and drove him to the middle of the street in front of everyone. And this was an extreme human rights case that in every one of us, an Egyptian, an Egypt, uh, felt that they could be in this place very easily. No, no, I mean, there's no law enforcement that, that protected him. We didn't go through the, the, the regimes that went that far in human rights violations. So that's, that, that's particularly one example that I became an activist online and in a different capacity. So, um, yeah. At the same time, like this, I had done research on this as well as activism. Like one of the journalists, Jennifer Preston of New York Times, said the Facebook page set up around his death, meaning Khaled Zayed. Offered Egyptians a great forum to bond over their outrage about government abuses. So this is very important. It was a case happened in the street. Uh, it didn't happen online in the way. It's just a case in the street. But it helped people to come together because it was a human rights uh, violation. That's why I always say that the, the Arab revolutions are human rights cases. I'll just uh, go through. Um, um, I'm going to do this very quickly. Uh, one of also the 
previous session I've done, I'm just going to uh, start here. Uh, it was about the use of, uh, of uh, Facebook. I was, I was, uh, I'll just take a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, the, age, uh, the age group of, uh, of Facebook activism in Egypt was basically between 25 and 40, 74 percent. This is very important because the young people led the activism uh, uh, online. The gender issue was extremely important. This is uh, research I've done myself uh, online uh, on, on the activists that I know, uh, 125 of these people should participate in, and 70 percent of them were female. And it's very important.
the flow, especially being a social media uh, kind of channel. Yeah. Uh, as Kelly uh, was saying, uh, it's been told that young people were changing and actually, this is our voice, it's not only our, my voice, it's my voice and my uh, colleagues from the Arab delegates. Yesterday we were saying and uh, we went into reflection of what we have learned from this experience that we are all proud of it. Uh, the events really have shown that youth can be a force for a change uh, toward democracy, the rule of law, social justice and dignity. That's the aim of each person loving this country, this Arab country. There are lots of stereotypes covering the Arab region. I will mention now only that the uh, that third world is also we have been teached by the first world. And this is really a stereotype that we refuse uh, nowadays. Uh, we, have, we have a stereotype that you are relying on the head of the West that keep on putting strategy of reform apparently. But we want to really highlight that uh, what we have learned today, that the change always starts on the grassroots level, on the youth level. People in Arab countries, especially youth, never gave up fighting for their dignity and sovereignty. They sacrificed and still sacrificing their lives towards that goal. And if not their lives, as we have seen by my colleagues, they use all the possibilities like social media and other tools in a very innovative way. What happened today tells us all to never underestimate youth capacities and the third world. They were leaders for a change in political regimes and social models. Because as we've seen in this picture, and this, the, this picture actually is really testimony, that the social sense is when we have a call from the core of the regimes, that is the united people from different ideological, cultural and religious background. Arab Spring is a movement led by youth that were supporting each other and aimed to universal goals of the dependency that was spreading across the Arab countries, from Tunis to Egypt to Morocco, Yemen, Bahrain, Libya and Syria. Our message to international communities to never underestimate the resources and the capacities we have and never ignore our strong will to dignity and sovereignty. It's our human nature. Either we have a cooperation toward a co development or we will keep on fighting and protesting to reach this goal. In both use and policy making, I think we have enough results of what the movements are being to do. To civil societies, we remind you that your sector is supposed to be the third power, but you are not showing the efficiency of this power. Believe in the impact that you can have toward improving society, as well as we address the same thing to the private sectors. You have your social responsibility is crucial for us, for you and for civil society. You can affect the grassroots level. And I want to take opportunity to thank PepsiCo by their representative, Mrs. Norma Hafni and Mrs. Kushkuma, because without this initiative of social responsibility, we couldn't be here and share our voices. Thank you. Thank you so much.